Oh, hello. Um, welcome to the inaugural Wilson History Oration. I'm Carmel Black. I'm the current president of Professional Historians Australia. I want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, work and live. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present and future, and extend that respect to all First Nations people of Australia. Professional Historians Australia is a national organisation and an overarching body for the professional historians associations in all Australian states and territories. Our objects are to promote the professional interests of professional historians and to advocate for the formal recognition of historians as professionals. Our members are all university qualified and accredited historians and have a huge range of skills and interests. And that can be applied to diverse projects on various platforms. They can provide accurate and engaging histories ranging from displays and publications to television and digital media. And, and also the professional historians are associations are a great place to meet people with similar skills and share knowledge and ideas. So uh, we are very excited to uh, bring this oration to you that um, I particularly want to thank uh, the Professional Historians Association of Victoria and Tasmania for um, initiating and organising and promoting this wonderful event that I'm really looking forward to. So I'll now hand over to our host, Alicia Soretto, who is a professional historian and former president of PHA Vic and Taz. Thanks so much, Carmel. And as Carmel said, we are thrilled to welcome all of you to the Wilson History Oration. As you know, it is um, in memory of Dr. Bill Wilson, OAM. And our, the idea behind it is that we present an annual online lecture for an eminent speaker to reflect and share their experiences of historical research, writing and audience engagement. I'd like to acknowledge that I live and work on the lands of the Bunurong people of the Eastern Kulin Nation and pay my respects to elders past and present. And before I tell you about our, our speaker tonight and how the webinar would, will run, I want to introduce you to Bill. Bill was a friend, a great listening ear and an excellent sounding board. I've missed him greatly. Uh, this past year or so. He was someone who could cut to the heart of an issue. As you know, he was a committed volunteer, not only for the PHA. Uh, there are probably lots of people remembering Bill and missing his contribution. Bill comes from law enforcement, um, but then had a second career in history. He supported the establishment of the PHA in Northern Territory. He supported the Professional Historians Australia, the national body. And once he came to us here in Victoria, he stepped straight into being involved with us as well. His commitment to our organisation and the field of public history in Australia was immense. And I got to see him up close as a great leader, a great administrator, and someone who was a friend and colleague to many. Tonight, you will hear from Associate Professor Tanya Evans. And during this talk, uh, I know so many of you are absolutely used to Zoom meetings, but this is a Zoom webinar. So that will mean that only the presenters and hosts will be seen and heard. Tanya will speak for about 30 minutes, but then we'll have 15 minutes of Q&A time. And if you have any questions of Tanya, you can use the Q&A button in the bottom menu bar of your screen and I'll put them to her on your behalf. We're recording this webinar tonight and the recording, recording will be available um, within the next few days or week. And if you want any of your questions uh, to be shared anonymously, uh, just you can tick that box in the Q&A uh, uh, button. 
Of course, keep your questions polite and respectful. And I wanted to let you know that if any of us have um, a slow or disrupted internet connection, we'll stop our video and continue with voice only. And so now I can welcome you to and introduce you to our, our speaker tonight. Associate Professor Tanya Evans. Tanya Evans is Director of the Centre for Applied History at Macquarie University in Sydney, where she teaches public history and modern history. Tanya leads the Australia and Aotearoa New Zealand Public History Network and was recently elected President of the International Federation for Public History. She's a member of PHJ New South Wales and ACT. And as you can tell from her bio, Tanya has a wonderful ability to connect with people from all over. Today, Tanya will take a deep dive into a multifaceted approach to public history, centered on one of her current projects, a historic site in the Blue Mountains of New South Wales. Thank you so much, Tanya, for joining us and over to you. Thank you so much for having me, Alicia, and for all of your wonderful efforts. Bear with me, I've now hidden my slides, which isn't very helpful. There we go. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the land of the Kamaragal people of the Eora Nation. Um, as I say, thank you, Alicia. Thank you to the wonderful, wonderful committee who have done an amazing job of putting this event together. And what an honour it is to be speaking um, uh, uh, in, in memory of Bill Wilson's work. It was an absolute delight learning about Bill's work, his valuable lifelong contribution to history, his long-term love of history through diverse paths uh, of employment, careers in the army and the police. He'd been a member of the PHA since 2002, first in the Northern Territory and then Victoria and Tasmania and remained at all times a really passionate advocate for history and the humanities. And I loved reading about how he recruited regional members into the PHA. And in all sorts of ways, Bill was an amazingly good citizen. And this really is the theme of my talk um, this evening. It's good citizenship that has really captured my imagination as a scholar, as a researcher and a teacher and someone who engages with lots of different communities um, in lots of different areas and in lots of different national contexts. And this is what I wanna focus on this evening. So as Alicia said, um, I teach um, in the Department of History and Archaeology at Macquarie University in Sydney, and I teach cultural heritage, public history and the history of sport. Um, and I'm director of the Centre for Applied History, which brings together a huge range of diverse researchers across the university, not just in the Faculty of Arts, but there are lots of members in the Faculty of Arts, in, in history, in archaeology, in the education department um, and elsewhere. But I also work with colleagues um, in the business school and in cognitive um, uh, psychology and now in sports science, which has been enormously fun uh, to, to begin. Um, and for over two decades, I've specialised in the history of the family, family history, and really in the last 10 years or so in public history, uh, which of course has sort of taken off worldwide in the last few years. I, I trained as a social historian in Britain, and I have always been profoundly committed to the democratisation of historical knowledge, national and international collaborative research practices, and the co-creation of knowledge. And really for the last few years, I've wanted to chart the impact of collaborative and community history projects with colleagues around the world. And I'm doing this as part of several different research networks. There's the Historians Collaborate Network that I hope some of you are aware of that brings together researchers who work on family history within local and community history organisations in Britain and Australia. And we've put together a lot of online events similar to this, bringing together diverse researchers, people passionate about history from all walks of life together to talk about their work in family history and how they can best disseminate that. But I also work in a couple of other uh, networks 
that are funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK, including the Inheriting the Family Network, which again brings together scholars working in Britain and Australia on the history of the family, um, scholars within universities, but also people who work within the glam sector in both Britain and Australia. And at the moment, we're having a lot of fun putting together a series of short films um, around our work. And I encourage you to seek that out if you're interested in it. And I've also started work with Jerome de Groot and Eloise Moss on another research network on histories at risk that again brings together scholars and practitioners of history outside of the university context. So all of this work is, is what I'm really passionate about. And as Alicia said, um, with colleagues in late 2020, um, in the midst of sort of, um, you know, that COVID nightmare, um, I had become increasingly aware in my work as president, as, as not as president at that point, but in my work with the um, International Federation of Public History, how people, colleagues, public history colleagues, were setting up regional and national networks of public historians um, across the world. And I thought, goodness, it seems to me that we should do that for, for this region, for Australia and New Zealand. And so it was um, very exciting to launch this network. And we're hoping to develop public history across Australasia by creating opportunities to communicate, meet and share knowledge among individuals and organizations who practice public and applied history in universities, in communities, within industry and diverse professions. We really want to encourage national and international communication and collaboration. And you know, something I'm really passionate about is introducing international audiences to the work that takes place here in Australia at a time when I think it's really important that all of us emphasize the cultural and social benefits of public history learning, teaching and community engagement for everyone. And I love extolling the virtues of the PHA internationally. I can remember uh, bringing up at a talk um, I was giving in Brazil at the International Federation of Public History Conference back in, I think it was uh, 2018, um, your list of um, prices for public historians, consultation fees. And, you know, colleagues around the world thought this was enormously useful for public historians um, for, for pitching um, and kind of making people value the work that they do. So um, I can't tell you how useful this is, and I hope that I can continue to share your resources with colleagues internationally so that everyone can learn about the wonderful things that you are doing as an organization. I'm currently involved in a number of different um, public history research projects. Most of these have been structured around uh, my work in family history over the last um, 10 years or so. And as some of you uh, may have heard me talk about in the past, um, I've argued that family history is enabling a huge number of people uh, to think historically and to produce distinctive forms of historical understanding that I think challenge academic monopoly of historical knowledge. And this is really exciting for public historians. And it's really exciting because family historians, despite huge changes in attitudes toward them over the last little while, are sometimes still marginalized by academia. And a lot of the work that I've been doing um, in, my, in my written work, in the work that I do with communities and the talks that I give, is to try and persuade people of the really valuable work that family and local historians are doing within their communities and to encourage those historians to, to share that work so that people can value it appropriately. So my work is really focused on community and collaborative history. And I'll talk in a little while about my work with the um, uh, the team that I'm working with in the Blue Mountains. But I'm also involved um, at the same time with colleagues working in education and cognitive psychology on, rem on reminiscence and memory work. So we're putting together um, a project uh, which is in progress at the moment where we are pairing or training up teenagers as oral historians to work with older members of the local community to undertake oral history interviews with those, uh, those, older, me uh, those older members of our community so that they might learn something about Australian history and, and global history and so that those uh, more mature members of our local community um, can um, use their memories and practice memory making that has really important um, cognitive um, benefits and mental health benefits as well, um, teaching everyone the importance of reminiscence and memory work. And it is my work with 
these diverse communities of researchers bringing together people from all walks of life, from all sorts of paths, all sorts of training, all sorts of educational contexts, all sorts of ages. All of this work as a researcher and teacher for me is really the favorite part of my job. Um, I love working on lots of different projects at the same time. <laughs> And look, I don't need to tell this audience that public historians are profoundly committed to democratizing history and broadening audiences for their work. This is your bread and butter. During the 1970s, following the growth of social history, the development and professionalization of public history facilitated really vital political and community engagement that was key to many international social history projects, both academic and otherwise. And many public historians like myself and others remain committed to the politics of public history. If they work in universities, and of course, many, many do not, they target their scholarly work beyond the professionalized and hierarchical academy, hoping to encourage others to collaborate with audiences and researchers outside of academia. However, this is getting much harder. This kind of collaborative community work, I think, is getting much harder because of government critique of universities, although hopefully that's changed now that we've had a change of government, although I think it will take a little while for that uh, to seep through. Um, this is getting harder because of reduced funding, and that will carry on regardless, I am certain, and many of my colleagues are certain. There's, there's a decreased public faith in universities. I always talk about how when I'm down the dog park <laughs> with my Labrador or talking to my son is now a first year university student. If I talked, you know, the, the parents of his friends really have no understanding of, uh, of universities uh, and what they represent in the current world. And I think this decreased public faith is a real problem of universities. Also mixed within this, the broader global imperatives of neoliberalism, the increased demand for university researchers across all disciplines to create partnerships with industry to fund research. In turn, there's also an internal and external focus on student employability rather than civic mindedness. And I think this is a huge loss. This means that university researchers, I think, and public historians more broadly, need to demonstrate more clearly what positive contributions to societies, universities, and public historian practitioners make. How do universities help create good citizens? As I've said, many people outside of the tertiary sector remain unaware of the valuable and worthwhile contributions many of us make to society through our work as researchers and teachers. And I think people have lost sight of the civic purpose of universities in the new focus on relationships with industry and the employability of our students. An emphasis on social impact and community gets lost in this discursive environment. And I have become increasingly convinced that those of us in the tertiary sector and elsewhere are compelled to better communicate the value of the arts and humanities in everyone's lives and for society more broadly, while our work is undervalued by the government and others. So this is why good citizenship has become the key focus of my research and teaching in recent years. Um, I teach an internship unit. Uh, I, I've just finished teaching it at the end of week 13, um, Cultural Heritage and Public History. And in this unit, I had 80, 80 students hosted by a variety of national and international hosts um, where they gained experience of public history and cultural heritage work in the real world. I, they had some fantastic opportunities to work with, for example, I, I've just implemented um, international opportunities as well as national and local opportunities and I guess COVID helped facilitate that and technologies have helped facilitate that um, but there have been partnerships with the National Railway Museum in York, England, um, with Public History Weekly which is an online blog journal that some of you may be familiar with that comes out um, from colleagues in uh, continental Europe, the International Federation of Public History whom I have worked with since uh, 2017. 
And I liaise with a huge number of partners locally with the City of Sydney, with the Royal Australian Historical Society and glam sector organisations, including the National Maritime Museum, the National Archives of Australia, local and family history societies, including the Society of Australian Genealogists, Camden Local Historical Society and Heritage Consultants, EMM Heritage, Accent Heritage, Mountains Heritage and Lantern Heritage, among many, many other partners. So students have the opportunity to pitch um, themselves to work with these organisations. And I think it's really important to address the employability of our students. I am absolutely committed to my students finding jobs after university. But what I also want them to do when they undertake internships with all sorts of in, in, um, organisations, whether that's industry, the glam sector or local and community history organisations, is to learn the value of teamwork, to learn how important their contributions to society can be. And I do this because some people think the provision of public history teaching within universities is an easy response to our neoliberal world's obsession with work, money making and home ownership. And I have argued in a recent article, and if you're interested in following it up in culture and social history, that serious scholarly engagement with public history holds the potential to demonstrate the value of a history degree to students, giving them a language of critical public history, thereby combating some of the neoliberal forces that endanger our discipline today. So I want to argue that public history is not only outreach for university-based historians, although that is important, or an obvious path to paid work for history students. Most of our students will not go on to get paid work as public historians or as academics, and it's important to recognise that. But public history teaching and scholarship that emerge from the subdiscipline of social and cultural history in many geographical contexts can have a really significant impact on learners with social benefits far beyond the academy. As I said to my students um, this semester, if the one take home lesson they get uh, from the unit I've just taught is that I want them to remain passionate about history for as long as they live. They may go on to work in banks, but they may be spending the wee hours of the morning researching their family trees. And I think that is a fantastic outcome. As John Saltmarsh suggests, a focus on community engagement rather than employability within universities shows how an emerging public engagement knowledge learning regime is competing for ascendancy in the current historical moment as a counter to the neoliberal logic of the academic capitalist regime. So one of the things that's really um, uh, occupied my thoughts in the last few years is that public history scholarship and project work both in and outside the academy tends to shy away from critical analysis of community and collaborative projects because community work you know takes time it's done in short time frames and there's not enough time to do that kind of critical kind of um, uh, analytic work after a project has, has ended uh, and also because community work is, is more often celebrated rather than critiqued. And I think this means that this vital form of scholarly and community labour goes unrecognised and not valued as academic or other work. And I think it's really important that we need to turn this labour into scholarship and theorise it appropriately so that it can be valued by the academy, organisations and ordinary people. So how might knowledge of the outcomes of community history projects contribute to national and international public history scholarship and help make clearer to global audiences the value and significance of history for everyone? So how do we best collaborate with diverse communities to produce history and then best disseminate the value of that work to others? I'm really interested in this question because since I became a historian, um, in the 1990s, most of my scholarship as a feminist historian has focused on making the work of women in the past and present more visible. And, you know, the question begs, are most public historians women? And if so, why is that? And, and there's a, there's a, you know, a wealth of scholarship suggesting that, the var you know, the, the majority of public historians are women in many different um, historical contexts. Um, and certainly my work with family history and local historians suggests that that is the case too. It's not entirely gendered female, but um, I think you could argue that uh, women predominate. And these are questions that have been kind of forming in my mind really since I um, first started my work in community history, which began with this book, 
on what at the time was my local swimming club. And I had enormous fun putting together this project with colleagues who were members of the club, uh, with people who were eager to participate in the local community, and with friends and public historian colleagues in, in the locality, um, who, including Ian Hoskins, for example, um, who were willing and able to contribute to this book. Um, and again, you know, my work in that contributed, uh, sorry, um, uh, focused on um, the history of female swimmers uh, in, the, in the history of the club that had been marginalised throughout the 20th century. And I wanted to bring to light uh, this history in order to make um, the lives of those swimmers um, uh, more prominent in people's minds. But also what was important to me was to um, make clear the importance of the voluntary labour that had allowed this club to, um, to remain functioning across the 20th and 21st century and how important volunteers are to clubs like these everywhere. Um, and again, that was you know, my attempt to, to, to valorise this form of community engagement and citizenship. And this work, um, providing a platform for people who have been marginalized in history, continued um, or was running alongside really at the same time, my work uh, with family historians in collaboration with family historians. And my book, Fractured Families, Life on the Margins in Colonial New South Wales, was written in collaboration with family historians. Again, trying to provide a platform for those um, individuals as researchers and helping or hoping to um, encourage people to revalue the labor of family historians and the impact um, their work might have on our historical knowledge. And this collaborative work with family historians continued um, since then. And this um, slide of, of a workshop in Orange was a History Council of New South Wales event, um, bringing together family historians encouraged to bring objects associated with their family histories to this workshop, to use these objects to tell stories about their families in the past. And this work was focused upon trying to encourage family historians to think about outputs, appropriate outputs for their work. Because I know many, many family historians who spend decades undertaking their research, but they just accumulate that amazing knowledge without thinking necessarily about how best to share it. And I wanted um, to gather those family historians together, local historians together, to think about how best to disseminate that work, again, so that people could notice it, could acknowledge it, and could value it. And I do this because in, in my last book, um, which was focused upon um, surveys with family historians and oral histories with family historians, it was becoming clear to me that so many family historians wanted to be part of academic discussion. As Laurie Bush says, I would love to be a fly on the wall when academics are having a discussion on something I'm interested in. Better yet, I would like a seat at the table. And I've worked with Jerome de Groot in, in the UK and Matthew Stallard um, to write about how we might best incorporate diverse communities into projects like these. You know, we wanted to, to query the notion of public engagement by suggesting, which has become a kind of buzzword within university circles, by suggesting that many publics are left cold by academic disciplines, conventions, and working practices. Instead, we suggest in this paper that we might learn more by inviting these communities in and learning from them, rather than attempting to engage them, a notion that still has a residual element of didactic pedagogy and a top-down power relationship. As Cassie Nelson says, she hates it when genealogists and historians don't get along. It's like watching my mum and dad fight. We wanted not to be in combat. We didn't want to be um, opposed to each other's models. We wanted to learn. We needed to question what we meant uh, when different communities of researchers think about history, evidence, argument, critique and knowledge, and thinking about how best to sort of acknowledge the different positions from which we begin and to challenge them through active and committed engagement with uh, researchers who aren't just like us. And we suggested there are a range of different ways that one can do that. We could co-produce and co-design research projects with a range of different people involved, uh, co-own data and, and both um, interpret data in, in collaborative ways, think about recognizing and equalizing different forms of activities, figuring out how we all upskill in the future. 
um, how we produce more inclusive conferences and symposia. And I guess one could argue that the online world has, has done quite a lot of that work really successfully. I know I found speaking with students who are differently abled or who have um, issues with neurodiversity, they have certainly really relished um, the um, capacity to communicate online and found a real freedom and liberation in the online world and sharing of information. But also collaborative training is important, sharing skills and historiography, thinking about how we can create new outputs, like I talked about the work that we're doing with family historians. And for me, um, I'm really interested in encouraging um, people outside the academy and inside the academy to think about creative ways of uh, producing historical knowledge. And in many ways, we're also still committed to the project of anti-commodification and political activism in much of the work uh, that we do. And this is the kind of work that has informed a lot of what I am doing with my wonderful team in the Jameson and Megalong Valleys in the Blue Mountains. It's amazing doing research in this area. I can't tell you how much fun I am having. We had the very good fortune um, to receive Australian Research Council funding for our project, History and Heritage, um, History, Heritage and Environmental Change in a Deindustrialized Landscape. And this project is uh, the first collaborative and multidisciplinary scholarly and community based study of a forgotten shale mining settlement in the environmentally and culturally significant Jameson Valley and Megalong Valleys. Our project aims to advance knowledge and enable cross generational engagement with the history and heritage of an industrial landscape, thereby improving our understanding of the long term impact of deindustrialization on localities and their social and natural environments. By combining archaeological, archival and oral evidence, this project aims to provide new insights into everyday working and family life, community, gender, transiency and migration that can contribute to conservation of this site and its industrial heritage, cultural heritage, tourism and education at a time of environmental change. And I'm working with a wonderful bunch of people and we're drawing all of our diverse knowledge and expertise together. There's me on Australian social family, local community and public history, the wonderful Lucy Taxa, who brings her, her expertise in labour, social migration and oral history, but also her enormous expertise in industrial heritage that is vital to the project. Sean Ross, who has incredible digital skills and in, in e-research. Penny Crook, uh, who's an historical archaeologist, Susan Lupak, uh, also an archaeologist, and we have an amazing Anne Coote, um, our research assistant, uh, who has been a long term member of the PHA, who is absolutely brilliant and we have really um, valued her proximity as a Blue Mountains local to the archives during um, a very disrupted uh, COVID uh, period of research. Um, and we also partnered with Stephen High, who some of you may know from his work on his work in oral history, his amazing work in oral history and deindustrialization in Canada. And we have amazing heritage partners to work with too, Fiona Leslie and Beck Parks and our industry partners, the Blue Mountains World Heritage Institute and National Parks and Wildlife Service. And all of us bring our diverse expertise together in order to, to think about the outputs we're producing. This was a wonderful focus group. And again, this is the kind of work I really, really love to do. I loved um, my archival work as a PhD student back in the 90s and 2000s, but I really love this people facing work that I do now. And we brought together in this focus group um, incredible um, uh, local historians who had worked for decades on the local history of the Blue Mountains and produced amazing blog posts and research reports and all sorts of wonderful outputs on, on Blue Mountains history, together with consultants working in the area, people who have expertise in walking tours, in mining history, um, together with um, other people involved and knowledgeable about um, the environmental history of the Blue Mountains. Uh, and this work enables us to draw together diverse expertise and um, experience and uh, uh, over uh, of different archives and methods we're bringing together you know your traditional archival research importantly for me family histories and local history and Anne has has managed to uh, to piece together 40 biographies of families, miners, wives, and their children who moved in and out of the shale mining settlement. 
Um, and we're bringing this together with archaeological remains and surveys, as well as the memorabilia held by local community and local museums. And I've had enormous fun uh, burying myself in those archives over the last little while when I can dash up to Sydney. And what's really interesting to us is that the history of this poor working class transient community, um, including the women, children and Aboriginal communities in the Blue Mountains, have been largely erased from local popular community memory and scholarly attention due to the competing interests of the mining and tourism industries. And this World Heritage Site, and um, many tourists who come to the Blue Mountains are not aware that it is a World Heritage Site, has largely erased its industrial past and the lives of those who once lived, loved and laboured there to concentrate on attracting tourists to the area to be spellbound by its natural beauty for economic purposes. So most of us will be aware of those pictures that I showed a few slides ago of the Blue Mountains from the top. <laughs> from the beautiful, the beautiful, spectacular, contrasting scenery of the, of the sky, the clouds and the mountains. But at the, at the bottom of the valley floors, there are remnants of coal and shale mining settlements um, that were populated in the late 19th century. And it's this history that this project is hoping to reclaim. But our team, and I've outlined them for you um, already, our team needs to meet industry, community and academic needs. And I've been burying myself in a literature, a fascinating literature on um, the uses of history and tourism um, in different national contexts. And what is clear is that settler colonial approaches to historical tourism tend to focus on nature rather than the much more messy um, built environment, the much more messy history associated with the built environment. It's, it's easier uh, to focus on that scenery than it is on industrial and deindustrialized paths. And what we want to do is to figure out the best way of producing digital simulations of this space and to think about how best to craft and construct narrative storyscapes. So how best do we use oral history, audio, um, the, all of those sources that I've outlined for you, how best do we use those to tell the history of this place? And the possibilities are endless, and there are so many different ways that we can do that. If you have any ideas, then please share them with me. Um, the National Parks and Wildlife Service um, are seeking information and evidence to support application uh, uh, for the site to be heritage listed. They are very interested in uh, the industrial side of this, um, of this site, um, the Bleichart Ropeway, for instance, um, and the industrial heritage. You can probably tell from my background and trajectory as a historian that I am most interested in the women and children, the family lives of this space. Scenic World, um, uh, whom some of you may have visited, want more tourists to engage in the history of the area and the site, but they're not optimistic that anybody is interested in the history. Um, and I hope we can challenge that. I mean, the, the family, um, Phil Hammond is profoundly interested in the history. He's particularly interested in engineering history, um, but he, and, and maybe he's interested in um, the, the, the kind of social history and the family history that, that we are interested in as researchers. But, you know, it's going to be interesting to figure out how we bring all those different um, desires together in the final um, outputs that we produce from the project. We have such a rich history to work with. Um, there's been some wonderful work done on the Carrington Hotel that some of you may be familiar with if you have visited Katoomba. There's a really rich visual um, and archaeological archive associated with it. And we want to get behind, sort of pick apart at these kind of um, mythological images, um, so to speak, of the Blue Mountains, of, of the spectacular site, the, the scenic splendor associated with, uh, with this area, and to figure out why it is that the miners, poor miners, shell miners, working in truly terrible conditions, um, subject to really horrific injuries as a result of the work they undertook there, why their wives, partners, children have been largely erased from public memory of this site. And of course, most mining communities are understood to be almost entirely male. And, if, and as we know from work that's been undertaken in Victoria, um, 
women were always there, women and children were always there, and it's important to us that we bring those histories to light. But also we want to bring to light the, the lives um, of the indigenous communities in the valleys and the way in which they interacted with the miners there. Um, and for us, it's really important uh, to make clear throughout this project in its outcomes and outputs, the political um, uh, focus of our work in the Blue Mountains and public history more broadly. And I am so excited about uh, charting the value and impact of community and collaborative work like this, like colleagues across my university are doing and universities around Australia and elsewhere around the world. I really want to chart and, and um, make people aware of that work, including the work of public historians outside of university contexts for the next few years. I really want to use these examples to make clearer to everyone, everywhere, why history is so important in our lives. History is important for us as individuals, but also for society more broadly. And I really want to end by asking you, please, to share details of your projects, their outcomes and outputs with the Public History Network. Um, and I hope that we can continue to have this conversation uh, for many years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, I just uh, tweeted out, just you, you tap into so many topics that are so close to my heart. And I, I really appreciate that. I'm sure loads in the audience will be feeling the same way. And uh, promoting and, and making people aware of those public history projects that are going on really all over um, is, is really just... Um, so important, so important. Um, I'm going to encourage everybody to put your questions into the Q&A box. Um, if you haven't done it before, you just click on Q&A and you can um, type in your question. You can be anonymous if you wish. I'll assume that if you haven't ticked anonymous that you're happy for me to use your name when I pass your question on to Tanya. But um, perhaps while everyone's thinking about questions to ask of you, um, I was just thinking about that, those sort of twin parts of, of what you were talking about, the democratization of history and the collaboration in a history project. It just seems like a natural fit. If you care about one, you care about the other, right? I think so, yes. And I, I, I mean, and it sort of goes without saying that we want more of us want people to engage with our work mm. but I think it's really important to make more obvious the politics behind that process yes um and and without that um explicit message I think people sometimes forget about the value of it um, mm. and you know of course not everybody has to do this collaborative work I and mean, that's not what I'm suggesting you know <laughs> yeah um, some people uh, are much happier in an archive and, yes. like, you know, and, and not working with real people. Mm. Um, and uh, there are reasons for that, individual mm. reasons, personal reasons mm. and, and professional and, and, and political reasons. And I, yeah. you know, it's important that uh, we allow all types of methods. Yes, <laughs> to yes. Be out there. Yeah, that's right. And I think that's, you know, um, for anyone out there who is, you know, a member of the PHA, you will have found that spread of work that historians can do and that, you know, um, may have found, they may have found their niche. Uh, but, it, you know, that community collabora collaborations on your part do seem like um, that's your niche, Tanya, and we're grateful for it. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting when I was thinking about, um, you know, how I learn about the work of members, you know, through news, mm. etc. And I do wonder sometimes, I mean, it, it takes time to gather this information together. But I mean, we found that with the Public History Network as well, trying yeah. to encourage people to share details of their projects. But sometimes I think, you know, all it takes is a couple of sentences, a, a short paragraph. Yeah. On what it is that you're doing, why and uh, what it is that you feel you have achieved and the impact. Mm. You know, it's so hard to measure impact of a, of a project and yeah. being exhorted to do that. I mean, but how on earth do you do that? Mm. Um, and I think we need to figure out good ways of doing that. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to go to our first question from Catherine, who says, can you detail the outcomes of the Blue Mountains project a little bit more? What will it be? A book, a website, oral history resources? Tell us more. Um, so, hi, Catherine. Lovely to, <laughs> to hear from you. So there will be a, a walking tour, a digital walking tour, 
Um, there will be um, uh, reports used by our, our industry and cultural heritage partners. So NPWS mm. require that. There will be your usual journal articles, academic journal articles. And I can't tell you how many. I mean, we actually didn't promise an enormous amount, which is often a good thing <laughs> when you're yeah. seeking funding. Um, I have learned to be less ambitious in my um, in my uh, uh, claims to output over the years. Um, but I'm not sure there will be a book at this stage. There could be. Crikey. I mean, in terms of the archive and what it is producing. But as I say, that walking tour is our priority this year, along with journal articles. And we do already have a website. Um, oh, you mean oral history resources? Is that your OH? I, th I think she does, yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah, so the oral histories will go into the walking tours. Mm. So we're hoping to use something that tourists can use um, and, and local community members. So we want local community members to also engage with the history of the site and school children. I would love a multi-generational project. Absolutely. I loved hearing, uh, you know, you just sort of tapped on a, a few things about, you know, using teenagers as oral history interviewers and those sorts of aspects. And it ties in for me to your conversation or, or um, encouragement towards a creative production of, you know, what is it that we're creating at the end? And I feel that Maybe COVID has been part of that as well, where we're prompted more to create um, perhaps more accessible resources, but also, um, you know, utilising the tools at our, our disposal, the technology tools, I suppose. Mm. Absolutely. And Francesca asks what, uh, she says, what enthusiasm, thank you. And do you encourage your community partners to write up their work? So um, I, I absolutely do when it, if uh, we're talking about family historians, mm. yes. Mm -hmm. And what's been interesting to, to me, and I've worked for a long time with family historians in Australia, yeah. who some of whom do write up family histories that are meant just really to be shared amongst family members. Yes. I think that's great, but I think it's important that actually they might seek audiences outside of that. Mm. And of course, there are lots of self-published family histories that are hoping to reach broader audiences. But what I discovered when I worked with uh, an amazing family history group in Canada, in Ottawa, that had 500 members and loads of really young members and lots of local and family history societies mm. are always looking for those elusive younger members that might carry on holding that torch over the years. Mm. A lot of them had, had websites, a lot of them had blogs, um, and there was a lot of online work being undertaken by family historians in Canada. And... Um, I think, yes, it is very important to write up their work. But going back on, the, on that creative point, um, the final chapter of my last book sort of talked about the kind of legacy of family historians. So a lot of family historians are thinking about legacy, not just in terms of themselves, but also their work. And I think um, it doesn't matter what um, shape or medium you present that work in. So there's amazing artwork being undertaken by people engaging with their family history. Um, I think it's brilliant if that work's going on. Um, so it really doesn't matter. And I mm. think the more the merrier in terms of uh, uh, projects. Uh, and there is a lot we, uh, there's a lot we have to learn. Mm. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, those of us who are working in, as freelance historians, we're going out and we're, we're finding those sorts of things where it is um, something that wasn't published widely or it's an archive that's held, but it's not known that it's held, um, but could be a great resource for a broader history. And also there are there are historians now using family historians as source family historian texts as sources. So mm. Katie Barkley is at the University of Adelaide and elsewhere. They're they're using these um, in their own work. Um, so it's important to think about um, the afterlife of this. Yes, artwork. yes, exactly. Afterlife is a great way to think about it. Um, now, Anna is asking about about um, how you think this approach could be undertaken in areas where there are large communities whose first language is not English. And I think, you know, any community that you're going into that, you know, isn't one that you're familiar with, how do you go about that as a second part to Anna's question? Look, um, I think it, it helps if you can speak the language mm. there, Anna. I mean, I, and Alicia, you've probably got more experience of this. I've, I've undertaken... Um, 
a couple of projects with multicultural communities. So for example, I'm doing a project uh, with colleagues in Hamburg and in the US on the history of German migration globally. Mm. And obviously I'm, I'm focusing on Australia and we have recruited, it's, it's a small project. I've got a tiny amount of money for it. Um, and really it could probably have happened for free, but don't tell our funders that <laughs> hoping for more money. Um, <laughs> And actually people have put it, ended up putting their hands up as volunteers, which was brilliant. I just put a tweet out and people got in touch immediately. Um, and we're just undertaking a few or a, literally a handful of oral history interviews and survey work. So I have become a huge fan of surveys. Um, they're a very low cost, uh, you know, te technologically easy way of undertaking research with communities that some people are very comfortable with because it doesn't involve quite the same effort and labor as an oral history interview and some people can be very confronted with the idea of an oral history interview and mm. you can you can put a lot of work into trying to make people more comfortable with that um, but I think just start small Anna um, you, you might have a large community but I would start small it's like a small pilot project I mean I've called this uh, this little um, um, project I've got going on German migration a little pilot project um, and but also, I don't know, Anna, if you tried that. I, I, I did a wonderful event with a few years back uh, with the Australian Lebanese Historical Society mm. and that brought together this amazing crowd of people, a lot of young people as well, really passionate about um, Australian Lebanese history and family history. Um, and again, you know, bringing an audience together to try and impart your message as to why what you want to study is important is one way of doing that and look it can take time it can take a long time but mm. it, if you're in it for the long haul then then i think that works really well yeah yeah yes i'm sort of reflecting on on all of those different projects where you are you know being able to speak the language or understand the context you know what what is your way into the community and it could be by working with others who have that expertise that you don't have i think absolutely now we've got a question from deborah and um I think our audience can probably read the whole question, but I'm going to sort of summarize a little bit. It's, it's talking about community and collaboration and the sharing of knowledge. And Deborah asked, do you or your students engage with policy development at local council or state level about preserving records or lobbying for funding for libraries and archives to preserve records, anything like that? No, I have not, Deborah, but it sounds like a very good idea. Mm. Um, a colleague has encouraged me to um, sit um, with RIDE um, to, to apply yeah. to RIDE local, uh, local council. I've certainly done a lot of work with the local historical society, etc., to do exactly that kind of work. Mm. And honestly, I haven't put my hand up for it yet because I, I, I do quite a lot already, but mm. I think it would be a very good idea. Um, particularly for students as well. Um, yeah, and if you have any ideas, please share them because I'm always looking for possibilities for student projects. Um, and, and, you know, there's some really good work could, could come about there. Mm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's interesting sort of as you go around with those different community groups and there's so much knowledge spread out. So I do like the idea of, you know, potentially students being involved too. Um, Look, they learn so much. I can't yeah. tell you. I just had my last class with mine on Wednesday, and and especially during they've gone through the, those two years of COVID, they said this, it was the first time they really felt re enjoying a hands-on experience, mm. um, um, doing history in the real world had made a, a really important positive impact on them. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. And and you know, thinking about the PHA and. You know, for me, back, back in the beginning, um, you know, as a student kind of looking for what's that connection that I need to make and was it was the PHA, but it was those real world experiences that were the other part of, of cementing it for me, I suppose. Yeah. We've got a question from Al here. And Al is talking about, you hint at the challenges posed by the research culture of the modern university, as in the pressure to publish in high ranking journals, et cetera and not to engage in community-based history work. Um, and there's a few questions around that idea of engagement and impact and all of those measurables that um, are the catchphrases around universities. Um, but can you um, say a bit more about how university-based historians might be able to persuade their bosses and funders to support 
work with communities? Well, it's funny you say that, Al, and uh, lovely to hear from you too. Um, I have literally just pitched an idea uh, to my Associate Dean of Research and others about gathering case studies of all the community and collaborative research being undertaken across the Faculty of Arts at Macquarie. Um, because, you know, I've I, I've become increasingly conscious that I only become aware of some of the wonderful work that colleagues outside of my department are doing when I sit on promotion committees or on prize and award committees. Um, and that message is not being imparted elsewhere or disseminated elsewhere. So I think it's really important that someone gathers all of that information together. So I am literally doing that at the moment. Um, mm. And also because I now sit on these university central committees where you know, people in the STEM disciplines have no idea about what arts is doing and doesn't really care because there's not much money in arts compared with elsewhere, right? Mm. And so it seems to me that if we gather this as evidence um, that we can share with the Faculty of Arts, and I intend to do that as part of an event later this year, but then hopefully we can share with the broader university community, community but also with the community outside um, and really help to convey how important that work is. And it might not be monetized, although often it is, mm. and actually people don't realize that because those of us who work in our disciplines you know, really are, have not existed within a culture where we have to do that. Um, but actually, it is important that we do. Otherwise, people don't value it appropriately and just share it and disseminate it more broadly. So, yeah, that's my answer to that question. Yeah, I hope it works. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, that really taps into um, some of the other questions that we've had here. I can see from Portia and others around the university and sort of as we grapple that, you know, um, that face of the university at the moment. Um, but more broadly, I think that promoting of the work, and I think that's where you sort of, you know, finish, finished off your talk um, as we wrap up our question time, that idea of, of a publicising history, um, promoting the work that, that is being done, but working alongside community to do it. I thank you so much, Tanya, for uh, your talk and for your generous uh, answering of all sorts of questions. I am going to now invite Kimberly Ma, who is the president of PHA Vic and Taz, who is going to close out the event. Thanks, Kimberly. Thanks, Alicia. It is my great pleasure to provide the closing remarks of such a fabulous presentation and for the inaugural Wilson History Oration. Tanya, we're extremely grateful to have you as our guest speaker tonight. There is no question, the bar has been set high for future orations. Thank you for sharing with us your experiences working on collaborative and community-based histories and the heritage projects as well. This deep dive in, with its extraordinary range of um, research and professional disciplines used to uncover the variety and layers of histories that underpin many of the projects that you're involved in, really tapped into many of the aspects that our esteemed colleague, Dr. Bill Wilson, was so deeply passionate about. I'd like to thank our organisers, Sonia Jennings, Mary Sheehan, and Alicia Soretto for organising the installation tonight, but also thank you to Carmel Black, the president of the Professional Historians Australia for hosting tonight. And of course, Alicia for being our MC and facilitator for this event. And finally, a big thank you to you, our audience, for joining us from wherever you are in Australia or even abroad for the inaugural Wilson History Oration. Thank you and have a good evening.